A very good afternoon to all the respected participants and guests of today. I, Anamika Burwa, welcome you all on behalf of BIPS for our today's session, the Policy Cafe, which is copy at BIPS, on the theme, In our gender and arms table, understanding the security implications of climate change. It is a great pleasure to have such a knowledgeable crowd among us with today. And thank you all for joining with us in today's panel discussion. This session will be moderated by Ms. Aisha Kabir, Consulting Editor, Pothamalo English. And now I would like to request Mr. Shafkat Munir, Head of Bangladesh Center for Tourism Research and also Distinguished Research Fellow of this, to commence the event with his precious opening remarks and also introduce our guests. And I also request you all to maintain all the necessary COVID protocol throughout the event and keep your mobile phone on silent mode. Thank you. Uh, it gives me great pleasure in welcoming all of you on behalf of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. Uh, COVID, as we all know, uh, really changed our lives. And that's why this policy cafe series, which was supposed to start a year back, had to be delayed until the end of last year. But here we are. Alhamdulillah, thank God, uh, we have started this program again. This is a uh, series of uh, policy cafes that we are doing. Uh, we did one last month on global trends, and we are doing this month on climate security. Next month, inshallah, we want to look at, uh, hopefully, uh, the 50th anniversary of Bangladesh as the theme. So this is a series of events that the BIPs will be organizing. Uh, the format for today's policy cafe is basically there will be remarks by uh, General Munir Zaman, moderated by Ms. Aisha Kabir, followed by a very interactive question and answer session or a discussion. It's a very interactive event, and I would uh, look forward to hearing from all of you as we go into the Q&A discussion. Climate change and security has been a part of BIPS's journey right from the start. We were perhaps the first organization in Bangladesh to look at the security dimensions of climate change. There's a lot of work that has happened in Bangladesh on climate change overall, but our focus, ladies and gentlemen, is on the security implications of climate change. And one of the key reasons why we have been so actively involved in the climate security discourse is due to our president's own personal commitment and association to this subject. So today he speaks to us not as the president of the institute, but as the chairman of the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. So I would just like to highlight a few things that he has done and BIPS has done over the years on climate security. General Nurizaman, for over a decade, has worked extensively on studying and analyzing the security implications of climate change. He has been the chairman of GMAC since 2013, and in his capacity of, as the chairman of GMAC, he has briefed uh, many international organizations, the P5 ambassadors in the UN Security Council. He has testified before parliamentary committees in the United Kingdom, Senate hearings, and also held briefings for members of the European Parliament. He was featured in a major documentary movie titled The Age of Consequences, and in 2015, the Weather Channel named him as one of the 25 global strategic voices on climate change. He has delivered talks on climate security in a large number of international events including the Planetary Security Conference, the Hague Talk, the Shangri-La Dialogue, the U.S. Air University, the National Defense College in Islamabad, and various other conferences. As part of the U.K. government's major climate initiative, he participated in the U.K.-led major climate risk war game and also contributed a chapter on systemic risk at the FCO study on climate change. He was a strong voice in various conference of parties and even held, if I remember correctly, a roundtable with the NATO Secretary General in COP15 in Copenhagen on mainstreaming the climate security discourse. He was also part of the Berlin process in articulating the climate security discourse internationally. So we are very fortunate that he is going to speak to us today about what climate security means for Bangladesh, what it means for the region, what it means for the wider world. I was particularly struck when the President of the United States uh, mentioned that the Munich Security Conference special event on the 19th of February, that climate change is now an existential security threat. So, I mean, there couldn't be a more ringing endorsement uh, 
uh, as we saw from the leader of the free world. So I think climate security as a discourse is going to get more momentum. And it's very important for us in Bangladesh to study and understand what climate security means for us. We are also very privileged to have with us Ms. Aisha Kabir, the editor of Prokamalo English, which is the English edition of the Daily Prokamalo, the largest circulating newspaper in Bangladesh. And, but I'm very happy to see that Prokamalo English is also becoming a large circulating newspaper in its own right. And uh, Ms. Aisha Kabir is a career journalist who has uh, worked on political and security issues for over two decades, and she has been a very long associate of BIPS as well. So we are very privileged that she has kindly uh, consented to moderate this session. So without further ado, I will hand it over to the chair, and I'm personally looking forward to this session very much. And once again, uh, thank you again for being with us. Pleasure to be here. I'm very looking, I'm sure, like me, all of us are looking forward to hearing from uh, General Munir Saman about this very pertinent issue today on climate security. Inundated and unstable, understanding the security implications of climate change. That's our topic, a uh, broad topic for today, and we'll go into much more details. So let me come straight to the point, General Munir. So what, uh, why has climate concern become such a vital issue in the 21st century? I mean, we talk about climate change, but now we're here, climate security. So why should policymakers consider this to be such a priority? Uh, well, thank you, Asha. And also my thanks to the audience for being with us this afternoon. Also, thank you, Shafdal, for that very generous introduction. The reason I think climate has become a security issue is for the reason that it has an all-encompassing impact all across the sectors. It touches things like food security, water security, energy security, livelihood security, disease security. It touches on areas that has direct impact both on human security and also has direct impact on state stability and also heart security. It is a conflict multiplier. It aggravates situations of tension, conflict wherever they are, and creates new situations of conflict and tensions and instability. Unfortunately, the countries which are weak and vulnerable are also the countries that are on the front line of facing the challenges of climate security. So it is third world countries, LDCs, small, under uh, low-lying states, island states, that have become the most vulnerable states in the face of climate security threats. And once again, unfortunately, the world is unprepared for this, completely unprepared for this. And when I say this, I am saying on the base, basis of my uh, direct interactions with a large number of governments worldwide and organizations who have not really devoted sufficient time and attention to understand and prepare for this. So now we are also calling for states to say that they should be prepared and they should find out mechanisms how to cope with the challenges of climate security. So it is a state of affair which I would call fairly dire. And we are absolutely way behind the curve. We are not going to face challenges for which we are we should have been prepared yesterday, not even today. So that is the condition we are in. And I'm happy that you brought up this question to start the discussion because we are in a very dire state of preparedness and the challenges are really grave. And as President Joe Biden termed it in the previous security conference, it is a threat that poses existential threat to many states. So this issue and today's program couldn't have been more pertinent at this time. So while introducing you, Shafka, I mentioned that you're the head of GMAC, the Global Military Advisory Council on Climate Change. 
Could you tell us something a bit more detailed about what GMAC is, what work GMAC does, <coughs> and uh, other details, what activities that involves? Briefly to tell you about GMAC, GMAC is an international expert body that has membership all across the world in all major continents. It's primarily composed of serving and retired admirals and generals and flag officers, and there are other non-uniform civilian experts. The Secretary General of GMAC is a former Assistant Secretary of NATO. I chair the Council for the last couple of years, and we have members from all major countries. We have also institutional members like RUSI and other major think tanks and organizations, again, all across the world. We work dedicatedly only on the security dimensions of climate change. So we work with governments, we work with international organizations like NATO, EU, ARF, research organizations. We have been interacting with many governments providing our expert advice. GMAC has also been a strong voice in all conference of parties of COPS. The first call to action on climate security was given by GMAC in Copenhagen in COP15. We were a very strong voice in Paris for COP23 and we played a major part in voicing our concerns and articulating how security of states might be impacted. And we had a small contribution to the process of the Paris Agreement. You'd also agree with me that in spite of all our understanding of the other dimensions of climate change by states, what really draws the attention when the security of the state is involved? So many of our articulations in Paris really reach the right ears. And I'm happy to say that even after long hours of negotiation, the parties were able to reach a conclusive agreement based on which we think that we should be trying to achieve something, at least, out of the Paris Peace Agreement. And my special look also comes back to the fact that the United States very rightly decided to come back to the agreement again. So we are again seeing new hopes of the agreement. GMAC also translate the scientific findings of IPCC and translate them to understandable, actionable security understanding and issues. So a lot of our publications are based on translating the complex scientific data into understandable policy discourse. We also work across complex boundaries. For example, we jointly authored a climate security risk assessment for South Asia and it was authored by flag officers in three countries. I authored it for Bangladesh, a four-star general for Pakistan and a three-star Air Force general from India. It is rare that a Pakistani general and an Indian Air Marshal sit together to pen down something which have common consequences. So. We are trying to explain to the people that climate change does not understand boundaries. It does not recognize the political boundaries we have drawn for our states. It is an all-encompassing global problem and we need to put our heads together if we want to survive together. So those are kind of the roles that GMAC is involved in and we are making our small, humble contribution to the discourse of climate security wherever possible. Yeah, I would say it's much more than humble because too often we see a lot of rhetoric, but GMAT seems to be putting some pragmatic um, issues on the ground. So when you're talking about climate security, it's a really broad subject, but could you give us some certain, what are the um, main aspects or main areas of vulnerability or the vulnerable uh, areas of climate security to specify? As I said at the beginning that it touches on areas like the nexus between food, water and energy. 
It touches on livelihood. It touches on infrastructure security. It has a direct linkages to extreme weather events and disasters. It has a link to human health and well-being. It has a direct link to disease security. We shall be, I'm sure, either you or I shall bring this up again and I'll have an opportunity to explain it further. It has direct linkages to issues that we normally don't think about related to climate. For example, cultural aspect of human civilization. It has linkages to history. It has linkages to international law and obligations. It has direct linkages to the maritime boundaries based on the laws of the sea. So it has, as I said in the beginning, it has a very all-encompassing aspect of its impacts. And that is that is why it becomes such a serious issue. You might also ask me, is climate change a security issue for all? It is not. It becomes a security issue for some states and it becomes a security issue at some moment or time. So we need to understand the process of securitization. So if the threat thresholds go up to a limit when the states are unable to cope with this with the normal interventions, it needs securitization. Then it needs and calls for security responses. And that is a process that many states are facing today. Example, the other states in the Pacific are suddenly in the category who have all the security implications of climate change, nothing else. The Maldives has severe security implications of climate change. Areas in Sahel or in southern part of Africa or in the Chad area in Africa, they all have serious security implications. And unless we understand the ramifications of the security footprint, we will not be able to address the consequences and address them by our intervention. <coughs> you are mentioning Maldives and other islands surrounded by the ocean, and even Bangladesh and Sweden of the Bay of Bengal. So, when we talk about climate security and threats, then comes the question of sea level rise. So, could you tell us something about that, how threatening that is for us, the consequences of this rise in sea level? I would say this has the most serious consequence. The sea level is rising. It is happening because very understandable reasons of the rise in temperature for which it has thermal expansion that pushes the height of the sea level. It's because of the melting of the ice of the Arctic. It has impacts on other human induced climate conditions. So therefore the sea level is rising faster than at any time. I would also like to caution you that the IPCC's scientific journals are now assessments are now saying that it is rising faster than the IPCC. Therefore, it probably has the most devastating consequences that one can imagine. Other areas of impacts are also severe, but the most severe impacts are going to come from sea level rise. It is going to inundate large areas of the known world we live in. Would you believe that 40% of the global population lives within 100 kilometers of the coast? Our civilizations have grown up along the coast. Our economic life is based on the coast. So are our infrastructures. So when you have almost half the global population living on the 100 kilometers from the coast, any impact of sea level rise is going to directly impact everybody. It is not the rich countries or the poor countries. It is not strong or weak countries. It is going to affect everybody. For the island states, 
in the Pacific, Pulau, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands, they will all disappear altogether. Large parts of Maldives will disappear. Bangladesh will lose 20% 20, 20 of its current land mass. It is going to have severe impact on the marine life that we know today. It is going to devastate much of the marine infrastructure and also the land-based infrastructure. It is going to impact on our energy security because a lot of our energy resources are dependent on our marine life, on our sea life. For example, it is going to completely devastate our supply chain mechanisms, for example, because some of the major ports today on which our supply chain is based are going to go out of the water. Rotterdam port, for example, is going to go out of water. Shanghai port will, is going to go out of water. So is Mumbai. Singapore. Singapore. Yes. So the, all the major communication hubs on which we have based our supply chain mechanisms will no longer function. Sometimes we are becoming myopic and not trying to see the problem that is right on our face. But it is happening, it's going to happen. And over and above that, it will be creating the largest mass human displacement in history, creating millions of private refugees. Asha will come to Bangladesh again later, but if you go back to the Bangladesh's analysis, even go back to the Bangladesh country's national strategy paper on climate change. It identifies that climate refugees out of Bangladesh should be to the tune of 25 to 30 million. Staggering numbers. And independent researchers like us, we put the numbers higher because the Bangladesh analysis was based on static population, but we are trying to see the population projections in the future which are going to do higher. So therefore, the displacement will also be higher. And as the population concentration increases, people tend to go closer to the coast. So the displacement is also going to be higher. So we are in a scenario where we are sitting on top of a volcano, where the world was unable to cope with a few thousand Syrian conflict refugees who went to Europe. It destabilized the political systems in many European cities and countries. Here we are talking about not thousands, we are not talking about hundreds of thousands. We are talking about millions of people on the moon. And it is going to be the most destabilizing effect of not only of security of states like Bangladesh or other countries, it will have direct regional security implications and it will destabilize the international system. So it is as serious as that, and we have to take note of this. Unfortunately, we are being myopic, or we are behaving, behaving like an ostrich, putting our heads in the sand and believing that nothing is going to happen. Because the consequences are so serious and dire that we probably don't want to think about it. You might ask me why I said this. I'm saying this because we have got conventions of all kinds of refugees and displaced people in the world. We have conflict refugees, we have economic migrants, we have all other categories of displaced people and refugees. But there is nothing that has been said about environmentally displaced people, or climate migrants, or climate refugees. But it is going to happen. So if that is a fate, then the international community might as well sit together and find out ways of how to address them. But we are not doing that. So that's why I said our preparation should have been yesterday, not even today. And we need to look at these problems really urgently and do something about it. This is such a pressing issue and such a, it's really like a crisis is upon us. And too often there have been cynics about climate change not wanting to admit it. So it's rather reassuring when we see that the new Biden administration in the US now 
is putting emphasis on climate security and special envoy John Kerry at the Munich Security Conference recently even invited Bangladesh to the US to join the climate summit in April. So how can Bangladesh leverage this, take this opportunity? I think that digging into the international community as loudly and clearly as possible. Maybe we shuffle in the room? Yes. Why don't you explain to us uh, the conversation you had in the Munich conference, especially with Secretary Kerry? Yes. Uh, <coughs> so, on the 19th of February, the Munich Security Conference held a special event. Uh, this year, due to COVID, they were not able to meet in person, which will happen later. But one of the uh, major addresses was by Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Change, John Kerry. And I was selected as a, in my capacity as a Munich young leader to ask a question to John Kerry about uh, Bangladesh. And the thing that I highlighted, which the gentleman Azimah has also mentioned, is the vulnerability and risk we face from sea level rise and the need for international community to step forward and help Bangladesh. So we were very pleased that uh, Special Envoy Kerry has made an announcement that Bangladesh will be invited to the April Climate Security Summit that the US government will be hosting. And I was very pleased that the media also gave it good coverage. So it's very uh, heartening to see that Bangladesh's case, the fact that Bangladesh has actually done a lot for adaptation and climate change, and Bangladesh's vulnerability is now being recognized at the highest level. What was also very significant in the MSC special event, which was addressed by President Biden, Secretary General of NATO, uh, Secretary General of UN Gutierrez, uh, the presidents of the European Commission and European Council, the French president, British prime minister, who's who of the world. Each and every person, including Bill Gates, everyone talked about climate change. And Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, actually gave a six-minute uh, sort of a special remark on how NATO is going to adapt to the climate security challenges. So as I said in the opening remarks, that climate security discourse especially under the current administration in the United States, is going to become a very significant hot button international issue. So it is very important for us in Bangladesh to actually highlight our challenges and seek the right international support. So I'm very pleased to see that we have been invited to this conference. Thank you. I have a unique opportunity to witness this event. It is an interactive session, so you can yeah. come and jump in any time. So as uh, he was explaining, I had a unique opportunity to witness this event. So, so, so if you just introduce yourself, many people don't understand. Uh, hi, this is Mohamed David Shofila. I'm working as Joint Secretary in Economic Relations Division, which is under Ministry of Finance. And uh, I'm working particularly in Development Effectiveness Wing, a wing which uh, coordinates the policy decisions of all the development partners and international communities. And my another uh, assignment is, uh, I'm, I'm the focal point of SDG Affairs of Economic Relations Division. Plus, um, today we are talking uh, this session at this coffee at BIPSIS on climate uh, security issues. And climate, uh, climate security is, uh, I, I mean, climate change. Climate change is one of a very critical issues of SDGs. For that reason, there are three SDGs, uh, 13, 14, and 15, which relates to environment and climate change issues. Uh, thank you so much. We have been uh, enlightened by your insightful uh, remarks about the uh, climate security issues. But uh, one thing, may I ask, may I propose one sure. thing right at this moment? I think to implement all these things, to implement the security issues related to the climate change, uh, the world, uh, the, uh, the whole world, I mean, including all the stakeholders, the governments, NGOs, private sectors, development partners, they need to sit together across the board and find out some innovative financing to address this challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, one thing uh, Shafa did mention that I would also like to say that the problem has become so serious that NATO Secretary General announced in the Minimum Security Conference that the NATO strategies are going to be revised in the top three threat areas, climate change will be one of them. So NATO will now directly address 
climate change impacts or climate security issues in the NATO strategy. So it has been elevated to that level of responsiveness. You've been speaking as an expert, and I'm thinking, even for those of us who are native people without that expertise, we are seeing uh, in our own lives the changes in the, the, the changes in climate. So, could you tell us that there are these, you know, alter, alternate, or this changing climate patterns or weather patterns? Are you going to lead to any possibility of extreme weather disasters, weather cyclones, or whatever? So, for example, we in Bangladesh are already experiencing that. We are a disaster vulnerable country, and climate induced condition has now increased both the frequency and the ferocity of the disaster that we are facing every year. And the same kind of experience is also being faced by, for example, countries like the United States or countries like Australia in the extreme heat of the fire that engulfed the whole country last year. So similar kind of extreme climate events are being faced across the world. And unfortunately, the number and the lethality of the disasters are only going to increase. And we've also had a large number of increase in both loss of human lives and loss of property. I will not go into the statistics, but the volume of damage that it has caused is increasing and many nations are not able to cope with it anymore. And this is going to increase in the coming years of decades. Unless we are able to intervene directly and do something about it. But I not I'm not still very hopeful that we are up to the task yet. But I can tell you one thing that disaster is going to be or one of the major areas where climate change is going to impact our lives, our properties, and the world as we live it today. Yeah, there's no sweet coating this problem because it's really a problem out there. And um, what other impacts? Do you think that there will be any impact on health too? Uh, as I said, that health is an area where there will be you'll take a lot of beating. Our analysis is now indicating that extreme heat is bringing back a lot of new diseases. A number of vector-borne diseases are coming back. We are now seeing a sharp spike in the number of waterborne diseases and things like diarrhea, for example. In Africa, malaria, which was curbed to a great extent in many countries, is once again hitting back. So in terms of the old diseases are going to come back and new diseases or pathogens are coming back into life due to extreme heat and pollution of water and deterioration of air quality. So in all the sectors, we're going to see spike in old diseases and new diseases coming back. So human health is one area where climate change will have direct impacts. And we already experienced that in Bangladesh and many other countries. And it again goes back to my saying that the countries which are the worst cheat and most vulnerable are also the countries which are weak. They are vulnerable and fragile. In many cases, they're conflict prone countries. In many cases, they can't afford to cope with the challenges, either from disease or other impacts of climate change. Can't afford. There's also a matter of economic sphere. And if there's going to be less resource scarcity, which is quite possible because of this, do you think that um, that can be a key aftermath of climate change, leading to social breakdown and stability, security concerns? Uh, we predict that the resource scarcity will be a major area which will trigger either conflict or tension or destabilization. There will be tension and disputes between group versus group, between community versus community, and it then graduates to the level of the state. We could see 
state versus state conflict or tensions. We are already experiencing that in some parts of Africa. Recent studies have directly been pointed resource as a cause of conflict in the Darfur area, for example. So resource will become a major source of tension and conflict as it becomes a source of instability. And these are all areas where climate change directly impacts. In some cases, it is sometimes difficult to see the direct causal impacts of climate impacts because in some cases, it doesn't have a linear pattern. So we cannot draw a line from climate change impact at point A to a conflict at point B because it goes through a complex pattern of other impacts and then results in a final impact. So it has an impact which is not linear, but it is non-linear. But it does have a direct impact. So resource is going to be a major cause of concern, especially for countries which are resource scarce. And they will have more severe impacts than countries which are financially or resource rich. And, uh, so, uh, there's one area which we've always been, not always, especially with development, we've been rather negligent about our ecosystems, but then Bangladesh or the entire world actually. So, will this be threatened by climate change ecosystem? Absolutely, absolutely. Our ecosystem is threatened. Our marine lives and marine systems are being threatened. Our rainfall patterns are changing, so it is having a direct impact on the water flows in our rivers, especially for a country like Bangladesh, which is uh, the world's largest riverine delta. So for us, our rivers are like our bloods in our veins, in our body. If there is the slightest change in the water flows or the current pattern or the monsoon pattern that it has an impact on our river system or river ice system, <coughs> it slowly kills the delta's ecosystem. So any damage to our ecosystem has a direct bearing on the survival of the river Rhine ecosystem. And similarly is the case in many other areas where damage to the ecosystem that climate change is causing has a direct bearing on the survival of the ecosystem and the state. And it is so severe that many countries and many places by end of the century will not be habitable anymore because of the loss of the ecosystem. And we are doing very little to safeguard this. Are there any other non-systemic threats like towards cultural identity or other things, cultural and identity threats? Uh, the best example that comes to my mind is the Pacific Island states. When the Pacific Island states disappear, it is not only a geographic entity that disappears, or the island that disappears, but with it disappears its history, its culture, its language, and all the heritage that once existed over the piece of land on the island. So we are sometimes very concerned about the physical things of impacts of climate change and we don't have sufficient time to focus on this other softer aspect impact of climate change. I briefly mentioned to you in the beginning that it also has international legal implications. Just imagine that an island X that disappears. What happens to its international treaty obligations? Who takes over its international loans and liabilities? Who takes over its financial liabilities that it owes to other states? What happens to that? We might, these are islands with very small populations. In some places, 20,000. Some places, a few hundred thousand. <coughs> But irrespective of that size of the demographic size of that population, as a state, it has all other bearings of a state. So when a state disappears, 
what happens to all those international obligations of a state. Also the fact, please remember that we have painstakingly built the international maritime boundaries, which is built on UNCLOS. And UNCLOS, as you know, that works primarily on baselines and shorelines, and their interconnected shorelines and baseline triangulations. So when a state disappears, all the basis of the triangulations goes haywire. We throw them out of the window. So not only we lose the maritime boundary for one nation, it has cascading impacts on the maritime boundary of a region or the world. So what happens on the EZs on which the state had once, when they go and relocate to another state, will they still retain the EZs that they once had? Or it becomes international water? So these are mind-boggling international legal questions which we have not even addressed at this very moment. But I strongly recommend, humbly recommend, that we need to look at them because they have long-term implications, especially for countries that are close to the Pacific Island states like Australia, New Zealand, and others, Papua New Guinea. They have direct implications on those countries. It is all right to relocate 20,000 people or 50,000 people, but the other aspects are complicated. And I'm glad you brought up the global aspect because we talk so much about globalization. So is globalization increasing the level of this threat? It is. Definitely, yes. Because insecurity in any place is insecurity everywhere. We have experienced that with COVID. We are not very well first that security cannot be contained in a state by the kind of the artificial political boundaries that we have drawn for ourselves. You know, what is the biggest problem here is that <coughs> the nature of problem and the solutions are incompatible. The nature of the problem is global and the solutions we are looking for are localized and rigidly controlled by our political systems. Climate change does not understand the term of the Westphalian state system, irrespective of anything. It does not recognize Westphalian borders. That is the reason that we have boxed ourselves in, but the problem is global. That is the problem we are creating for ourselves today, I'm slightly digressing, of not providing vaccine equity. We are thinking that we can save ourselves and the rest of the world can go to hell. It is not. If any single country goes to hell, it will draw us down, drag us down with it. By not vaccinating everybody in the world together, we are making a fundamental mistake. Because you must be reading that the virus is fast mutating and taking out other forms. So by the time we vaccinate ourselves as a rich country, it will be completely redundant because it has mutated to some other form and it will reach our shores. Similarly, on climate change, it is a global problem. It needs to be addressed globally without being rigid on our nationalistic or supranationalistic principles. It is a civilizational problem. It touches the human race as a whole. It doesn't touch Bangladeshis or doesn't touch Spaniards, Americans separately, it touches us all. Any country, anywhere is vulnerable, rich or poor, black or white, everybody is vulnerable. So therefore, we need to address them on a global basis, based on our civilizational values. Otherwise, we will not be able to solve it. Um, so this is actually affecting us in every sphere. Um, a bit worried because while we are quite happy with the progress we are making, development, we've been emerging from the ABC status that we are so thrilled about and good news. But will this have an <coughs> effect on our development, on countries' development, even achieving their SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals? So we have such will, a good path. So I would defer <coughs> my answer to Mr. Shapiro. Yes. He's the best person. Yes, person. No, no, no. Since you, you work with us, I SDGs. can supplement, but I'm not the best. So that is a matter of concern. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. 
before going to uh, answer this question, I would just like to uh, supplement uh, your talk. Uh, that was, uh, and I think that we need to uh, think globally, but act locally to solve the problems. I mean, the global uh, climate issues. Because uh, every problem is country specific. In Bangladesh, we say we face one sort of climate change which is not, I mean, which is not fit for other country. So one shoe, uh, one shoe doesn't fit all. We have to apply. We have to think globally. We have to set our strategy globally, but on the basis of the country context. I think so. And regarding, uh, would you please repeat your oh, question? Uh, no, we are really happy that uh, we are emerging from the LDC status because we are doing so much in development. But this climate security, climate change is going to affect our development process, affect our tri uh, achieving the SDGs. Will that be a threat to? Uh, uh, I think that uh, we are talking that climate change is a global concern and it's a pressing challenge as well. It will continue, it's an ongoing process. Unless we start thinking right from today, we would have thought from yesterday, but still, we, if we need to act, if we, uh, act urgently, then I think we can uh, minimize the problem, but this issue will go on. And SDG, I have told you that there are three goals related to environment and also climate change so the whole world is concerned about it and they're also uh, trying to uh, collect a fund a common global fund for innovative financing of climate change so let's hope for the best we can wait and see in fact many of the sdgs also have an indirect linkages indirect you know, SDG, you know SDG is a, it's a very comprehensive, all-encompassing, very ambitious and complex goal, I would say. Because MDG was, uh, there were less targets, there were less goals, less indicators. But when it comes to SDGs, it's so huge. Yeah. It's so huge and so difficult. Especially, there are two major challenges uh, we are facing to implement the SDGs, not only in Bangladesh, but also globally. The first one is how to how to manage the financing for such such a big. I mean, to implement this holistic uh, sort of thing. Second issue is data positives. Data. data collecting data is another big challenge for the SDGs. And <coughs> since ERD deals with goal seventeen, partnership for goals, it binds all the goals together because. Whatever you want to implement, you need money, you need financing. So partnership, there is no alternative to partnership. And for partnership, uh, our government has done the uh, right thing at the right moment. That is, they have taken the whole of society approach, involving all the stakeholders, the government, the NGOs, private sector, development partners, business, academia, and so on. <coughs> the government has also introduced mapping of the ministries to coordinate all the ministries together so that they can they can work hand in hand say for example uh, for poverty uh, no for agriculture agriculture ministry is the main coordinating ministry but it has also other associate ministries who will work together to come to a solution similarly even though partnership for goals goal 17 is uh, is the ERD's main goal but there are other associate ministries will work hand in hand to implement this, uh, I mean, this, uh, Thank you. this, we, we this. Have, yeah. Could you introduce yourself? Of course, yeah. My name is Anne Sherman. I'm with the U.S. Embassy, and I cover environmental issues. Um, and thank you so much for organizing this event today and this discussion. Um, I just wanted to comment on your recent question about development issues. Um, but first, just to say, as others have noted, the United States sees no greater challenge today confronting the world than climate change. Um, and we've made, uh, we've wasted no time re-engaging on these issues. And many of you saw that in um, Special Envoy Kerry's first week um, in office, he made two different phone calls to the Bangladesh government um, among his first calls, um, sort of to indicate how important we see Bangladesh um, on climate leadership issues. Um, and over this weekend, um, the foreign minister also met with John Kerry in Washington again to discuss climate change. 
So I think the United States has really recognized Bangladesh's leadership role on climate issues, and we're really eager to re-engage on this um, on this important issue. Um, another point I wanted to make is last week John Kerry also addressed the UN Security Council yeah. and talked specifically about um, climate security. Yeah, well, 20, 30, yes. Um, and he also mentioned this uh, fact that climate is a threat multiplier and that it's a security issue that is should be dealt with at the, at the UN Security Council. Um, but I think one interesting thing about climate change is unlike other security threats, we also think that it presents an economic um, opportunity that if we can uh, take advantage of uh, renewable and clean energy or climate smart agriculture, that there's ways that we can build back better and that we can even uh, find ways to grow our economic prosperity by addressing climate change. So I wanted to ask, um, obviously, um, our distinguished experts and also our government colleagues, you know, how are we thinking about integrating climate into our future economic development plans in a way that can actually grow prosperity, um, you know, and also mitigate the huge threat that it poses? May I go to Thank you. Thank you very much for raising this issue. I think uh, with climate change, one of the major threats will come uh, with the food security. Food security will be a great threat. Oh, we, we are coming to that point. Thank oh, you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, then in that case. Uh, but I just wanted to pick up one point that you mentioned. Uh, we have also experienced this problem of not having the right data or sufficient data in working out such the analysis of plants. And uh, I humbly like to also point out that many states don't maintain data integrity. So that is a problem that we face in many places. We need real genuine scientific data. Real time. Yes, scientific real time scientific data, which is not politically motivated, so that we can have the right intervention plans. And I'm happy to note that you did bring up this point that data must is a real useful tool if we want to have the right intervention plans. You know, there are data of the SDGs and among them 104 are quantifiable, but the rest are not quantifiable. So it's very difficult to get yes. qualitative data, all of you know that. In that case, we have to work all together to find out the solution. Absolutely. And we have to find a real thing that is uh, and maybe back to you also um, joined in about the US policy and what has been done, what has been spoken, because it has been a concern, not just for us, but globally, about the international community. How far is that uh, international community actually prepared? Which you have answered uh, partially about the US, which is a very positive and reassuring standard. But in the international community as a whole, how? prepared are they to come up with sustainable policies to confront climate change or climate change related security issues? I would say positive and negative both. I think we are slow to react. The only point of hope that I see now is the Paris Agreement. If we are able to implement the Paris Agreement, and uh, if we can keep the temperature increase up to 1.5 degrees. That is our last hope. Probably beyond that, we don't have any more hope or any more space for working anymore. And we enter into areas of catastrophic change. But uh, as an independent student, I find it very difficult to say that we shall be able to achieve 1.5 degrees. Because uh, the implementation of Paris Peace Agreement has been rather difficult. You know that uh, the whole agreement was based on INDCs. Now they have come to the point of NDCs, nationally determined contribution. In most cases, they are not very verifiable. So these are commitments that states have made and they need to make those contributions. I only hope that we, everybody, 194 states that signed up to it, can maintain the level of commitment in carbon emission control that they signed up to. 
if we can do that 100%, then probably we'll be controlling that at 1.5 degrees. Otherwise, many of the researchers and policy researchers are now saying that it is inevitably going to go beyond 2 degrees, probably to 3 degrees. And uh, please go back sometime when you have time, look at the 3 degree scenario. It is a catastrophic scenario. I hope it doesn't come to that, but it might. So you should all be thinking about it, talking about it. But I think the best hope we have got so far is if we can implement Paris Peace Agreement. That's why I said at the beginning that I'm so glad that the United States came back. And we need to work with other large polluters like India. We need to work with the Chinese. And all of the big emitters and polluters who are working on the issues. Uh, their act has to be in line with Paris. For countries like Bangladesh, we are not a polluter. We have very little carbon footprint. So very, very little. Insignificant. We are only suffering because somebody else polluted us. But then we are all in it together. I, I am one person. I don't want to go to this brain game. This is not time to do the brain game anymore. We've got all got to look positive and work on it together. And uh, we need to work with the big, large polluters. But I'm happy to say that Scientific innovations is again giving us some hope. <clears throat> scientific innovations are showing us some thoughts that we can have some hope. But then the margin of error has become so risky that we don't have any more space. Either it is 1.5 degrees or we are down the cliff from where we cannot return. Sort of dire specific cause of action, would you say? Any specific? Because we know that uh, it's beyond national boundaries, as you say, to regional, international boundaries. Is there any specific cause of action? Plus, another thing I want to ask you, because as you being a uh, um, security expert and also yourself a military officer, or just a military officer, what is the role of the military when it comes to? Kind of security, since there is a security issue. Uh, this is a rather simple answer in the sense that we've got to continue rigidly on the path of mitigation. And that is where we are cutting down the emissions and going into a greener life. We are going to a non carbon world. Those are the ways we can mitigate ourselves. At the same time, many countries and many situations and many scenarios are beyond mitigation. So we need to actively go into adaptation mode. I'm once again happy to tell you that Bangladesh has got a very robust adaptation strategy. I have gone over many other adaptation strategies of other countries, but we are perhaps way ahead of others. Where we lack is the resources. We cannot afford it ourselves to implement that adaptation strategy. So we need to have a twin track strategy of mitigation and adaptation, and then go into a zero carbon life globally. And those are the aspirational ambitions. At the same time, many organizations, not only states, need to become clean and green. And the first organization that needs to green itself is the military. The military as an organization, internationally and globally, is the largest polluter. Our tanks, our ships, our aircrafts are our large polluters. A single tank can pollute as many as 1,000 cars. So therefore, the military needs to take a stock of its, what I say, carbon footprint, not footprint, and we need to reduce our carbon footprint. But I am again very happy to say that the military is also most advanced as an organization in addressing climate change, behavioral change. I have worked quite 
quite a lot with the US military colleagues in the United States and they are way ahead of others in trying to analyze their own footprint or footprint and trying to reduce them. They are way ahead of alternative energy for the ships and aircrafts. So the military takes this very seriously and I see that even during the last four years of Trump administration, the, the military never stopped in their work on climate change issues internally. So as an organization, the militaries everywhere are taking a leading role. Now, what is the question? What should be the military's role in the response mechanism? My understanding is that this, uh, any response mechanism of state has got to be a whole of society and a whole of government. And in that, the military is, a, is sometimes a major component, particularly in weak and fragile states where they don't have much state capacity. The military has one of the best capacities of those states. So the military has to be integrated into the response strategy of the state. And for that, what they need is proper assessment and planning. The military is a large organization in all states and you cannot move it very quickly. It has to be tasked, it has to plan, it has to retool itself, it has to train itself, then only it can be prepared to work on a response mechanism. But the military provides some of the key assets that states will need in providing the response mechanism to the impacts of climate security. I am happy to say that many states have taken note of this, especially large states, powerful states like the United States, the British military and other militaries we have worked with. But many of other states have not taken this as seriously as they should have taken. Also the fact that uh, we together with the American Security Project, which is a DC based think tank, did a worldwide survey of understanding which states take climate change as a security issue. Very interestingly, over 110 states in the world identified climate change as a source of insecurity. But it stopped there. It did not go beyond that. It did not address how the insecurity would be addressed by the state and what would be the role of the military. So those are the areas we are now trying to analyze and advise other countries and governments that they need to address. They need to assign tasks. They need to have a response mechanism and a strategy. Even now, let us be self-critical. Bangladesh's national strategy paper is one of the best in my mind. It does identify 25 million climate refugees due to sea level rise. But it stops there. It doesn't say what will be the consequences of 25 people becoming refugees? How will you address it? It does not address or analyze that. So those are the gaps and the gray areas where we need to address, analyze and plan for it now. But certainly, all states identify, most states identify climate as a security issue. What we need to work is on the response strategies and mechanisms. And I think we can be very positive about that in the sense that from what we've seen, at least on the Bangladesh experience, not climate change, I mean, it is general disaster management. The security forces have played a very yes. positive role. And in fact, even the US security forces have had, if you remember, recall the Operation Sea Angel, who they've always responded, there's always been a good response. So that is definitely an area we can look forward to, to uh, that. The possibility of more than just mitigating or adapting. But actually, at the same time, we should also remember that the problem is so massive and so huge, it is completely beyond the capacity of the military to respond. Completely beyond that. It will need a complete whole of government, whole of state response. And I would also like to caution here that there should be no effort to militarize climate change at any time. Climate change is not a military issue. It can be and will be in some places a security issue. So 
it should never be militarized by the military or the state because military is certainly not the right tool to address climate change. It is one of the tools. It was small tool. Very small tool. Security. As a part of the security response. So the main is to analyze and identify the security implications and where needed, securitize it, but never militarize it. Thank you. So I've been asking you many questions to get a get an understanding of a subject which we know about, but perhaps not we're not experts. So this has been very illuminating. But I'm sure our audience now has got many questions for you. Well, so they have more answers than I have. <laughs> many questions, many comments. <coughs> so that could we have a round of introductions, perhaps? If I'm not mind, could be handed around them. If everyone could just. Briefly introduce. Oh, when you ask. Whenever, whenever, whenever you ask. See who raised hands. My name is uh, Brilliant Bhakti Ritter. I'm basically a freelance motivator, counselor, and a leadership trainer. For the last two years, uh, almost one and a half year, I was confined in the house. I was invited a number of times by this, but it's what I could attend in seminar. Uh, my question is, sir, Bangladesh, as, I, as you already mentioned, that one of the least polluting countries of the world, only 0.4 ton per capita pollution. But if you compare with many other uh, developed countries, there are even a developed country who pollutes about 20 ton per capita pollution. So, at times we hear about uh, carbon trading. My question to General Maris Zaman, do you think that this is a, a good solution that we go for carbon trading? This is number one question, sir. And uh, you talked about uh, migration, sir. Bangladesh, with the rise of the sea level, SLR we call, sea level rise. Uh, one fourth of the coastal belt will go under the water differently in the coastal side. And there will be a migration of for about uh, 20, 30 million people. And where they would go? Differently, they would choose capital cities or other bigger cities. Dhaka, Chittagong, or Khulna. So do we have the ability to take on so many people, migrated people, to a smaller cities like Dhaka, Chittagong, or Khulna? You talked about the health issues. Sir. In the coastal band, with the rise of the sea level, the water, uh, saline water gets intruded in the land part. So as I know, uh, the pregnant ladies particularly, those who take the saline water, uh, there are premature babies, they have the abortion, <laughs> and the rate is very, very high. I was, uh, I'm doing a research on this, I'm a PhD fellow, and I'm doing my research on this uh, climate change issues of the coastal belt. And while checking down the Data, I have seen that a good number of uh, pregnant ladies are badly affected in the coastal belt. Uh, I am not sure about other countries, but in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. So, we are Bangladesh is sandwiched between two uh, one is the coastal belt, another one is the uh, Himalaya. Uh, the, we, as you know, that there are 50, that we have about 57 rivers going in Bangladesh. Out of 57, 54 rivers are actually the uh, country. We are the lower rapidant country, and due to the higher rapidant countries, we are badly affected. Uh, both ways. When there is more water, we are affected. When there are less water, we are badly affected. So, what could be the solution? Thank you so much. I think this lady would like to say. Would you like to take a few questions? Okay, you can actually have that. I'm Sheila from the Singapore Consulate in Dhaka. Thank you, General Manizaram, for that trenchant presentation. And uh, if I may, I would like to make some comments and ask a follow-up question. Uh, I think, first of all, the presentation really reinforces what uh, Sir David Attenborough's warning to the UN Security Council last week, that if we continue on this current path, we will face the collapse of everything that gives us our security. Uh, like uh, Bangladesh, Singapore is also a very vulnerable nation and climate change is now an urgent challenge. Just to uh, illustrate, 
a few weeks ago, the Singapore government unveiled a Singapore Green Plan 2030, which is our new national agenda on sustainable development, built on five key pillars. City in the nature, sustainable living, energy reset, green economy, and resilient future. But, um, and to do all this, we had made special allocations in our 2021 budget. But just to give you a sense of the enormity of the, the resources needed, Agri Food Culture Cluster Transformation Fund, 30 million for electric vehicle related initiatives, uh, 5 billion for new coastal and food pro uh, flood protection fund to protect Singapore against the rising sea level, and also finally the issuance of green bonds to finance selected public green uh, infrastructure projects. So this brings me to my key point here that sustainability requires capital, enormous influx of capital. So I would like to hear your views on how developing countries can overcome this challenge of uh, climate financing. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Jess Maxson. I'm Director of Programs with the Green Council. My question, again, I would echo thanks, sincere thanks for this session and the insights provided. I really welcome the discussion that began to revolve around solutions as well as some of the problems. Um, I had some really interesting ideas there around coalition building, multilateral engagement, um, a combination of top-down, bottom-up approaches being required for what is a very broad problem. And I think my question really relates to inclusive engagement for generating solutions. So arguably, youth put this issue on the map. A younger generation really brought this to the fore. Um, and my question is really, what are the security implications of not engaging with a wide range of young people, from rich to your young uh, rich to poor, uh, in terms of identifying some of these solutions? Um, and as an example, perhaps, you know, what are some of the institutions, agencies that we might work to, to develop and cultivate to make sure those voices are heard? Um, and, a, and a few of you are from here. So Bangladesh National Strategy that we referred to, who is involved in crafting that? And is there a stronger voice there that should be articulated from a younger demographic? Thanks. Yeah, we'll take these three questions. We'll take these three questions and then we'll go to the next. First of all, the first question. Um, we did mention that, I'm glad that you brought it up, that Bangladesh has a huge problem of sal saliva inflation. Due to the fact that the rivers are not charging enough due to changes in the river flow patterns and due to the fact that the sea levels are rising, there's a back charging of saline water into sweet water rivers and also into our agricultural land, resulting in loss of productivity of our agricultural land, also the impact on human health, also the gender aspect of human health. I just saw the other day that 83 species of river fish in the coastal belt area is going extinct due to saline intrusion into Sweetwater rivers. You don't know that the Shundabans, which is the world's largest mangrove forest, is dying in front of our eyes. Four percent of the forest has already been eaten up by the sea. The Shundori trees from which the forest derives its name is dying due to salinity and other impacts of climate induced conditions. So therefore, all the aspects of salinity is being felt in Bangladesh. And if you ask me if climate change has a taste in Bangladesh, I would say it has a saline taste. <laughs> it really does. And also, Bakar, I would say that when we talk about 25 to 30 million climate refugee population due to SLR or sea level rise, it is not a country's problem. Bangladesh, such a small country with 170 million people and expanding, does not have the capacity and the space to take them as IDPs. 
it will naturally result in transboundary migration. And the direction it can go is only, only towards India. It cannot jump into the sea. These people will be looking for dry land to migrate, but they will go towards India. Then what happens? India has unilaterally fenced Bangladesh. It is one of the largest fenced borders in the world. We have 4,500 kilometers of border with India. It has already fenced 3,700 kilometers and rapidly expanding. It will probably electrify that border. It is also a border which is extremely lethal because we have about 100 Bangladeshis who are being killed by Indian border guards every year, either coming close to the fence or trying to cross over the fence, whatever. So imagine when hundreds and thousands of people are trying to flee to higher ground and drier ground, what will be the state of that border? It will certainly be absolutely an area of catastrophic consequences because it will be resisted by India, any migration towards that country. That is why I said in the beginning that we need to address these issues now, work out international mechanisms so that those migrations happen within some international framework and they don't become chaotic resulting not only in human insecurity issues, but state security issues. I completely understand, Sheila, that Singapore is a country that has some of the best plans. It is also a first world country. So if you find it difficult to climate finance yourself, imagine countries like Bangladesh or other countries. So financing, Sustainability project is the biggest challenge. And the challenge is also slightly man made because the promise of the Climate Green Fund that has been made in Paris and also committed by other countries is not, not yet being materialized. So those promises have already been confined to papers. We need to see some implementation of this commitment so that. We are able to intervene in time. What we can do today with $10 of adaptation and sustainability will cost the international community $20 or $50 five years down the line. So let us see the problem in, in, this, in pragmatic approach and do the interventions and sustainability effort now instead of doing it tomorrow at a higher cost and also at a different cost dynamics. Completely agree with you, so not much of an answer. We need to engage the young generation. It is their role. It is not your role. It is not something not my role. It is their role. It is Greta's role. Those are the people we need to engage. Those are the people we need to work with. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Shapila, don't take it as a criticism. No. Bureaucrats want to keep everything to themselves. We need to go down to the roots. And sometimes they probably have better understanding than we do. I also have a criticism. And some of the approaches and solutions to climate change are very country specific, as Mr. Shapiro rightly pointed out. But quite often we see donor driven agenda that does not take recognition of the indigenous knowledge that exists on the ground. Very traditional knowledges, knowledge base that exists in many African tribes and societies. Because of the fact that they have managed to survive for all these thousands of years. So they must be, they must have some knowledge by which they survived. But sometimes we take all our strategies and approaches in very mechanical approaches. We've got to be more humanistic. We've got to go back to the roots, to the tradition, to the young people, to the community and to the community elders, 
and bring all their knowledge base into our solution strategies. I am a very strong advocate that in some of the key strategy tables, we need to have young people as young as 10, 12, 14 years old. They should be sitting with our ministers, talking about tomorrow's world, how they want the world to shape like. Our ministers should be sitting with them and talking to them, not talking to us or talking to the secretary. They should be talking to them. And I can tell you that their ideas are far, far better than ours. I completely, I'd be more than happy to engage with you again, talking about this issue. Thank you for again, once again. You have rightly pointed out but things are changing. The scenario is changing because now the bureaucrats are more development oriented for people. I think the, the things will change now and the second thing is that uh, all the water uh, related catastrophes, to deal with all these water related catastrophes, the government has formulated Delta 2100, which gives a detailed comprehensive view of how to address these issues. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I will also like to caution one thing, it's very small item here. Some of the intervention plans that we are coming up with are not tested on conflict sensitivity point of view. So I will request everybody that whenever we work out an intervention plan on any issue of climate change impact areas, we need to do climate sensitivity risk sensitivity plan because sometimes by trying to solve the problem, we are creating bigger problem. And I have seen this in definitely in some areas, both in South Asia and in Africa, whereby we want to change the, the turn on the ground so dramatically overnight that it has destabilizing impact on the society and the community and then triggers further conflict. So let us not do those kind of short-term understanding and strategies. I would also like to caution here of my experience of seeing other countries and working with them. We need to have far, far better safeguards and transparency of the climate funds. Otherwise, the climate funds only line up the wrong pockets. We have to have definitely two layers, three layers, four layers of accountability. We need far greater transparency of the expenditure of our climate funds. Otherwise, instead of the solving the problem, we'll only be creating social problems. Excellent problem. Uh, excellent statement, uh, you know. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Rakhi Bulani. I'm country representative of the International Union for Conservation of Nature in Bangladesh. And uh, I must say, I'm the first, I'm even the first general I met who said we have a footprint. Uh, so an excellent, excellent way of expressing and also recognizing that is a problem is, I mean, everywhere is not just in the civil society, it's also the military and, and kind of handy uh, kind of uh, we were saying that we can walk together. Uh, we need to walk together. This is the point that I'd like to emphasize. Um, you also, uh, uh, Ms. Kabir has mentioned about the impact of climate change in the system and how we can impact on our other sphere of life. And uh, this is where I see that uh, we can join hand. And I've been, after coming back to Bangladesh, I think over the charge of the largest uh, you know, conservation organization in the world, I've been trying to reach the defense community because I see this is the lost opportunity. And because, uh, because of your footprint or footprint, whatever you say, and there, there we can join hands. And you, you mentioned about the security issue of climate change. And we walk on the other side. Of course, climate change, but it's also how we impact on the ecosystems and the species. And the IPC, IPBES is the equivalent of IPCC. And they have predicted million species under extinction. And the thing that I use is really is a nature based solution. So you need to invest in nature. And that's the uh, that the impact we are seeing of the climate change is there's always a tendency to see, I'm not saying that you state that, but in a general tendency, a general understanding by different people, is that climate change is a separate issue. It is not. It's only a cause, that, uh, only an effect. The cause lies with us, and the solution also lies with us. And, and, and whether we take nature as a part of the solution, uh, it's going to impact on the nature, and nature, investment in nature and people, 
we can also have solutions. So uh, this is the plea to you that you, you can raise your awareness among the policy makers and bring uh, the, the sector into the discussion in, in our future solutions, nature-based solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Excellent idea. Okay. Yes. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Shuang and um, so I'll be talking in perspective of like the youth. Like, I'm a 23 year old, I study at the University of California and I'm also an intern here. And um, I would first like to thank um, the Honorable Representative of the British Council, thank you for bringing uh, the topic of youth into the discussion because obviously this has been like a major, major focal point, especially in the recent years. Now, my, the topic of my question and my discussion is going to be the skepticism that we the youth have towards the entire decision-making process of whatever we've been doing regarding the environment. And with that, I'll put a two-prong example of it. So the first example I'm going to use is, as you've seen if you've been following the news recently, that Texas has experienced snow for the first time in 126 years. And because of its fuel that economy, it had a blackout, a statewide blackout in Texas. And it wasn't, and the state of Texas is not even connected to the U.S. national grid. So all its constituents and all its people there had to suffer. Like you see videos all over the news that they couldn't receive basic food, water, and shelter. And amongst all of that, the senator of Texas, Mr. Ted Cruz, apparently went on a holiday. Now I'm not saying that <laughs> particularly <laughs> like he did that just because there was an issue, but that creates an image among the youth, right? We have an elected leader over here who decided to go outside of Texas and makes a crisis. And amidst all of that, the entire climate catastrophe was taking place. So it raises the question, so where are we as a stakeholder, as a future stakeholder of the effects of climate change in the decision making process right now? Because climate change, the effects are not just going to happen in a day. The solutions are not going to happen in a day either. So moving forward, where are we as a stakeholder? Where do we make our voices heard for an answer to the future? Now the second example is the most technical example which is for the first time in the history of mankind where the world came together under one umbrella to make the Kyoto Protocol under the United Nations. First time ever in history we recognized that climate change was a major problem. We tried to do something about it, but eventually it failed. Like, sorry to say, it failed, use the word failed, but it did. And there were many, many issues there. So the first thing was like trying to commoditize like carbon dioxide as a commodity, using carbon taxing, trying to find out how that would play around. It didn't work as much as we thought it would and it eventually failed. We also failed to account for the fact that there were rapidly developing economies all over the world that might have pollution in the future, not just now. And that's even happening to this day. We have so many fast-growing, rapid industrializing economies. So my question is, as a stakeholder in the future effects of climate change, um, could all of you, and Mr. President, and Mr. Secretary, could you tell us, how would the youth right now actively get a place in the decision-making process. Thank you. Can we go back to you, Jess? Maybe share your thoughts? So once again, definitely do not have all the, uh, the answers to this, but I think there are some, some potential options on the table here. And it goes back to that principle of coalition building. Um, there are examples, and many countries don't get it right either. It's not that uh, um, this is an issue unique to Bangladesh. It's actually a global problem. Um, but uh, in terms of ensuring that a younger generation has a voice around the table, what are the kind of platforms that are being listened to by decision makers, and are they representative of that younger demographic? As I said, rich to poor, um, male, female, etc., as well. So an inclusive uh, demographic there. Um, I think there's also an opportunity for decision makers to see what's going on on ground as well. So, um, I mean, certainly I've come from the UK, I've lived in London, where there is arguably a very London centric decision making process going on in, in, in that part of the world. Um, and perhaps sometimes similar, similar in Bangladesh, where strong DACA orientated decision making. So, the more the decision makers can get into uh, different localities and indeed speak to people. Uh, across different ages and demographics, uh, the better. Um, there are models like national youth parliaments um, and uh, national youth policy forums, and again, ensuring that representation from those institutions 
is, is relevant and is there, is at the table um, when those decisions being made. Um, so I think there's a combination of one off activities that can be done, uh, longer term behavioural patterns and shifts in decision making that might be required as well. Um, so it's not an easy answer, um, and there are multifarious solutions uh, to doing it. But it's certainly, of course, something the British Council should do and engage with partners here on Thanks. But it's only something that needs a definite focus on. And I'm happy to work with you or some others, come up with a sort of a policy prescriptive paper on this. How the youth voice should be integrated into this. Thank So, my name is Mahir, and I'm a student of uh, Master Student of Geography and Work from Jagir University. So my question was pretty similar to me, uh, but I want to uh, add a similar point that, that last year we had uh, volunteer national review process, which is a complete process of ACD, how it is implementing in Bangladesh or in the road side. Uh, so my point is, uh, in, in CSO platform, or our youth voice was not adding in this, in this process, the volunteer national review process. So how we can add our voice or input uh, our thinking to that process and if, if we have some other opportunities to uh, raise our voice to uh, make some policy or implementing some policy process, so how we can do that? So my question is, how, how, what is your advice uh, to us, to each people, to add that point, to add that policy process? That's the reason why I said we will work out and suggest some platforms how your voices could be integrated into climate policy making. But it's certainly something that needs to be worked out. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. My name is Olivia Kalani. I'm the deputy head of the Spanish Embassy. Uh, so my country is also called louder, please. It's a global question, so we are also affected by climate change in a different way uh, the Bangladesh is because uh, our, in our case it's more about the certification of roads and so on. But Anyway, this is a global this is a global issue, and in my country we have a saying, and I would say that in Spanish is something like uh, "No dejes que lo urgente te aparte de lo importante," which means something like "Don't let urgent matters to overshadow important matters." And I have the feeling with climate change that it is a very important matter. It has always been important matter, but it has never been urgent. For I don't know the national community. At some point, there was the economic crisis, and I don't know the Arab Spring or the war in Syria. And now the COVID pandemic. I have the feeling that the momentum, the moment for climate change, has never come. So I would like to know what is your opinion on this. Or do you think we have already somehow got used to having the climate change back in the back of our mind, or something like that? Because I think it's somehow in fashion, but at the same time, out of fashion already. It's, it's, not the, it's not the moment of problem. So I would like to make too much I would more or less agree with you that it is something we all talk, are talking about. We are going to conferences talking about it. But nothing tangible like a crisis that we are making an intervention. Perhaps uh, one way of doing it would be to bring in the youth voice more strongly who are concerned about their future or on a more cynical basis maybe we will wake up after a climate Pearl harbor we will probably wake up after we have a major global disaster due to climate change and then perhaps we'll wake up again but at the moment i agree with you that we are not working on this as if it is a crisis it is a crisis plus, but we are not reacting in that manner. In uh, some ways, we are trying to escape it by other ways. I would also like to mention to you that some of the colleagues I talk to internationally are very actively considering other means of mitigation. They are talking about climate geoengineering, for example. And those of you who are familiar with the term would agree with me that it is a very risky, dangerous proposition when you do climate engineering without sufficiently trial and tested data and without a proper 
global international governance structure in place. But I know that some countries, some institutions have gone way ahead in their <coughs> trial and testing. And I won't be surprised if somebody tries to divide something without understanding the consequences. So, if, in case you're not familiar with it, please go and have a look at climate geoengineering, how people are trying to lay mirrors at the stratosphere to deflect the sun rays, reaching the earth, or spreading aerosols up in the atmosphere to deflect the sun rays without understanding what sort of consequences it will have. But climate geoengineering is being seriously considered by many people, but we need to put our heads together to understand how safe it is, whether it is cost effective, what are the long term consequences, who takes charge of it, a lot of unanswered questions. So I have done some work with the Carnegie Ethics Council on this, but I came back very unhappy. So could we have just one more? One more, we should, we should finish we in the next three minutes. Maybe spend the last question. Yes, this will be the last question. Um, and it's from a young person. Mm -hmm. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, my name is Mohammad Arma, I'm a chief and I'm a fourth year student at North Southern University and my major is environmental management with a little bit of environmental policy. So uh, I have a few questions. Uh, Just ask one because we yeah, already yeah, have yeah, time. I, I, I have <laughs> one. So one, and the one is about the um, security of water mainly. Uh, we, we have seen there, there were several protests or activism regarding water security which is really uh, related to climate change and um, there's been several issues regarding even um, Khulna was extracting water in Khulna and there were several protests regarding it and they, uh, the protesters often get um, face a lot of violence regarding it. So these sort of issues and even uh, the shipbuilding industry and the same industry which saw a lot of protests and activism. So what does it imply to um, different forms of environmental activism in Bangladesh where we are supposed to have free speech regarding our environmental activism or environmental advocacy. So what does it mean to you or the adult um, activists who want to see a change in the environmental uh, scenario of our country? I agree with you that environmental activism in Bangladesh sometimes is quite difficult. But I, in spite of that, I would strongly argue for you that as young people in the country, you must continue to have that activism in case of environmental war. We did not sufficiently address the issues of water in our discussion. I just like to make two quick points. One is water issue problem internally published. Due to overdrawing of groundwater without sufficient data, we are now faced with a large poisoning of arsenic poisoning in our groundwater. Bangladesh faces great challenges of water sharing of our transboundary rivers. On all our rivers are transboundary in nature. And the northernmost riparian region, we face water withdrawal in the upper riparian region of India and sometimes in China. Whole of South Asian region is a water stressed country. This area of the world has some of the gravest hydrographic challenges. If there, in, my, in many predictions, if there is ever a conflict in South Asia, it perhaps will be over water. There are grave water security issues between India and Pakistan in Indus Water Treaty, which sometimes looks very fragile now. There are even more serious water security issues between China and India over the sharing of the Bamakuta water. And imagine all these countries are very powerful, large countries with a history of conflict. And these are also nuclear countries. So any issue of water sharing or hydrographic challenges that might result in even a localized conflict can have cascading effect in conflict escalation. Another issue that I'd just like to point out before I finish is that the Himalayan ice glaciers mm -hmm. are melting faster than ever in history. And if this rate continues, then the ice tongues of Himalayan ice glaciers will become extinct in the couple of years down the line. 
and we are going to have more flooding in the short run and we are going to have prolonged drought after the ice is gone. Another problem it has brought about is that due to excess melting, we have created a large number of glacial lakes in the upper Himalayan region and of which at least 200 <coughs> glacial lakes are categorized as dangerous by ISIMO, it's an international organization based in Kathmandu. And if any of these lakes, the banks are so unstable, if the bust, then we are going to have tsunami like flooding downstream. We have already experienced two of those minor cases in India recently. Imagine if a bigger lake bust and we have glacial lake outburst flooding, wrong, then we are going to have devastating consequences downstream, particularly for lower riparian regions like Bangladesh. So those are the sober thoughts. I wish I could finish up the session with something more promising and more positive. But the only thing I can say that these are problems that the world has never faced before. It's a global problem. It's a civilizational problem. We all need to act on it together and timing is, time is running out fast. Let's act today, let's act now. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I know many of you have questions now, but we'll be having a tea after this so we can discuss them. Thank you. Thank you. We had a very engaging session, and I'm very pleased that so many issues were brought up. And uh, it just shows the enormity of the problem of climate change and insecurity dimension. There are so many layers to the climate change puzzle. We talked about adaptation, we talked about mitigation, we talked about carbon trading, but we also talked about hydro conflict, which the gentleman has just talked about. We also talked about the reducing the footprint or the role of the military in climate security, which the NATO Secretary General elaborated upon at the MSC special event. Uh, all I can say in summary is that for countries like Bangladesh, which already has a plethora of other challenges, climate security could emerge as a major challenge and become an obstacle on our path towards greater development. We meet at a time which is very historic for Bangladesh. We have just graduated out of the least developed country uh, status into a developing country which we are all very proud of. But we have to address these challenges, we have to work, all of us have to work together with the government of Bangladesh, the civil society, the international organization and all our international friends, those present in this room and other ones as well, to find a common solution. I was particularly struck by the saying that Emilia mentioned that let the urgent not supersede the important. I, I hope that's a, a good uh, translation. And I wish I could say it in Espanol, but my Spanish is not so good. But uh, I think that's the key message. We have many urgent problems, but let the climate change and the security implications of climate change be one of those urgent crises that we have to tackle. And I'm very happy to say, ladies and gentlemen, that since 2008, BIPS has been steadfastly working on this issue long before it had even internationally become a prominent issue. And our commitment to working on climate security remains the same, and we will continue to work together. We will continue to work with all of you to find durable solutions to this human problem, which affects all of us. And please stay tuned, as there will be a number of publications coming up on climate security, as well as this event. Once again, on behalf of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies, I thank our speaker, our moderator, and all of you who made it such an enlightening, enlightening session. And so please now join us for refreshments. I'll hand over to Anamika for the next announcement. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a well informed and enlightening session. And I thank our keynote speaker and also the moderator. And thank you. Shaf Mr. Shafkut Muni as well. Please join us outside to have a cup of tea and all the refreshments. Thank you so much. Thank you.